Good morning, everyone. So I guess we got a little rain yesterday and maybe we'll get some rain today and tomorrow. I'm not really sure, but uh, again, I'm, I'm happy that the rain was delayed and now it's warmer. So it really does feel like uh, springtime. Uh, as I noted on the lecture recording at the very end of our lecture on Monday, I, I guess I had a connection problem and that's the first time that's ever happened. Um, I, you know, I was finishing up the geometric series, the telescoping and the sum. And then of course I was still talking, but then the, the screen froze. And uh, funny about it is that when I completed, finally a window came up and said connection unstable, but that was after, after it stopped pretty much. So I guess uh, my uh, gateway Xfinity connection, which is supposed to be the best in the, uh, you know, realm right now in this area. I guess they had a little uh, a glitch, but but it wasn't bad. I, you know, I've, I've been fortunate that, that, you know, throughout the pandemic, I've had good connection. And as long as, as, long as you provide them a little extra money, uh, they make sure that everything is good. So, so uh, just remember unlimited is not true unlimited unless you, uh, you know, pay a little bit extra each month. But but I think we all know that with our with our cell phones and Wi-Fi service and internet, whatever. I mean, it's a, maybe one day all of this will be free. <laughs> I don't know that that would be nice, but but maybe not in our lifetimes. So what I want to do is complete the topics that we have uh, with the uh, convergence and then move into the integral test. So like I, I hope uh, this material is a little less. Uh, stressful because it's you know very much akin to what you did in calculus one and hopefully bringing back a whole lot of the limiting concepts that you talked about so so though it's a little different maybe it's not as as stressful but but i know each of you have different ways of looking at things so let me go ahead and share my screen now where we ended yesterday what we basically found out, and this was to, this is to complete 9.2. So I'll just write complete this or just complete. So we had the geometric series and we did all the work, did all the difficult stuff. And I wrote it in this form. And we concluded, and let me, always need to check. Let me check the, uh, there we go, get that nice and sharp. Good. I, I often will do some, you know, I adjust the, the way I do this IPVO thing, all kinds of things that I can do, but I like it to be clean. If I know I can see it's clean and clear, then I know it's good for you all, because I think your, your vision's probably a lot better than mine. So if I think if it's, if I think it's blurry, then, then, then I know, you know, maybe you don't look at it that way, but, but I want it to be clean. So now we figured out that this was A divided by one minus R, if and only if. And so, so we, we've, got, we've got a restrictive setting here, but, but at least it's a setting that not only tells us when we have convergence, but it actually gives us the sum, which, which again, we can't always rely on. And this would occur using our special limit when R, the common ratio and absolute value, was less than one. And so this is what we call the convergent, convergent geometric series. And we'll do some examples with this, but but again, this this should remind you of what you did in pre-cal, and maybe you talked about the the formula here. Uh, I don't know if you derived it or whatever. I usually derive it in pre-cal uh, so that when the kids get to Cal two, it's not just the first time they've seen it. But if not, it doesn't matter. You all are good students, and 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 our derivation was uh, fairly straightforward. Now. Again, like I say, I'm going to do a couple of examples with this, but I want to cover a couple of results that we have left in this particular section that are good and useful. And these are going to be convergence results. So the first theorem, 
Again, these are all notated in the lecture notes that I have on Blackboard. So that's even an additional source, maybe more than you need. And this is basically gonna be properties of convergence. So, so when, we, when we work with convergent infinite series, just like when we work with uh, convergent sequences, which an infinite series is, we, we want to make sure that we're aware of the properties like linear linearity. And we have the same thing with, with the series. So let's fix a C as a constant element of R and suppose, and remember also we have the monotone convergence theorem. Suppose that N equals one to infinity of this series, that is this particular infinite series converges to some A and we have another infinite series that converges. So, so when, we, when we write something like this, ladies and gentlemen, we're tacitly assuming that, that the sum exists, that A and B are less than infinity and that this, this converges. So that's a, that's a common technique um, you could just say this is less than infinity, or these basically are, are the sums. And it, of course here, A and B are real numbers. And of course, fixed. We know limits are unique, okay? You learned that in calculus one, and you probably proved that. Then we get some nice linearity properties, and these, these will not be a surprise to you at all. So if we, if we make a new nth term, so to speak, sometimes I call this the generating sequence, we usually call this the nth term of the series. If we, if we make a new nth term by multiplying a sub n by the constant c, what does that do? Well, it's, it's just basically like limit theorems in calculus one. The new limit will actually be c times the limit of the original series, CA. So again, the C factors, just like we have in derivatives, just like we have in integrals. So that's, that's a linear property. Two, and we, the, the author breaks this up into two pieces, which is fine. I, I, I don't have an issue with two and three. So now we want to generate a new nth term where it will be the sum of a sub n and b sub n. So you can, you can actually think of this like doing integrals. Now, of course, we don't have as many uh, nice properties with the infinite series, but we do have some, which is, which is better than nothing. So if we have a new nth term, and, and this is basically created from convergent series, then, then the actual sum of the new series will be the sum of the two uh, sums here. So or we add the two sums from the original series. So this is A plus B. So basically what this says is that we can break these up into two pieces. So, so this is basically the, the series A sub N plus the series B sub N, just like this would be C times the series here. So again, we call these linearity, linearity. Now, of course, if the sum works, then we would certainly expect the difference to be working too. So we'll do that. And I think what I've marked here is that I'll prove number three. So we'll have n equals one to infinity, and then we'll have a new nth term where we subtract uh, b sub n from a sub n. So just like when you're working with finite series, clearly finite series converge, I mean, you know, you add up a finite list of numbers and that's clearly less than infinity. So you use those linearity properties all the time, just like you did in pre-cal. And of course, with the Riemann sums in calculus one. So this should not be a surprise. It should not be a surprise. I mean, if we didn't get the linearity following through to convergent series, we, some, something's not working right. So, so this is exactly what you would expect. Okay, so... So again, sometimes what you're doing when you work a problem, you just go ahead and break it up and keep your fingers crossed that everything's going to converge. And, and that's what you did in, in calculus one. So, so that technique always opens the door to getting to a limit if it indeed 
exists. So let's look at three. Let's see, why is this true? Now, what I've done here is look at this in terms of how we've set up all of the series to this point. We look at the sequence of partial sums. Remember, remember when we, when we talk about the convergence of an infinite series, that implies that the sequence of partial sums derived from the series converges. So, so what we can do is do this, and, I, and I've written it this way just to change it up. Consider the partial sum S sub n. So we'll have k equals one to n. Remember, this subscript just tells us how many uh, uh, terms that we add. Okay, so n, so we're going to add n terms, start k equal one to n. And we'll just say we have a sub k minus b sub k. So that's the partial sum. Now what we want to do is apply the limiting process. Then this object right here, which is n equals one to infinity of a sub n minus b sub n is now the limit of the sequence of partial sums. So we'll just write it out. This is the limit as n goes to infinity now, when you look at this and you think about this, we, we now replace this object with the limit of the partial sums. And so this is S of N, which is actually this object here. So we just go ahead and say, all right, let's go ahead and fill it in. K equals one to N of A sub K minus B sub K. Again, we've been doing this, especially with the telescoping and how we define the infinite series. So if this actually converges, this must converge. And so now, now we're saying, okay, we have the limit as n passes to infinity of this object. But now what's inside is just a finite series, a convergent series. So again, we can write this as the difference of the two series, just like we did in pre-cal. So again, using, uh, uh, what is it, the common sense approach, which is always useful. So now we have the sum k equals one to n of a sub k minus the sum k equals one to n of b sub k. I like to do some of these proofs because again, they, they just basically attack the basic premise of the limit of a partial sum which, which again is important to, to master at this point. And it'll, it'll get easier and easier as we work through. Now, now, of course, we've got two objects that we know converge. That is, our hypothesis here says that this actually converges and this converges. So now we apply the limit procedure, which has linearity. That is the limit of the difference is the difference of limits. So it's like, okay, we're keeping our fingers crossed that things will work. We know the limit is linear. So we have this. Minus the limit as n passes to infinity of this object, k equals 1 to n of b sub k. So, so now it's like we're in a calculus one class, basically. And now we look at this and say, well, again, back to the hypothesis, this limit exists, it's A. This limit is A. This limit exists, it is B. And we have the result. So, so it's, almost, it's almost like it's obvious, you know? When you look at these types of problems, you're thinking, well, it's going to have to be this way. I can't, I can't, you know, you know how you do a, a double negative? I can't not study if I want to do well. I mean, you know, that means I must study if I want to do well. We, we often use that as an expression to emphasize that, that this has to be this way. There's, there's no way it could be otherwise. So, so again, the, the process of linearity where we can break things apart is very useful. 
we always know that with finite sums, but the finite can now be extended to the convergent series, okay? So think of this like a linearity property that we use all the time with our integrals. And of course, we, we rely on it. We, we do that without even thinking about it. Okay, now, so, so again, use these, use these. We, they're, they're at our disposal, so to speak. And we, 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 we use them, again, you, you're gonna use this and not even think about it because it, it just, it makes sense. Now, there's a result here that I want to mention that actually gives us a major convergence test. And we often forget about it. And the convergence test will actually be the contrapositive of the result that we prove right now. So here's another theorem. And we'll just say convergent series, I'll just give it a name, convergent series and the nth term. Sometimes I say the generating sequence, the nth term a sub n. So that, this, this basically connects the convergent series and the nth term that actually generates it. So, and I'm just gonna say uh, very useful. And it'd probably be more useful in the, uh, uh, the contrapositive form, which I'll state, but this is, this is an extremely important point. So if the series converges, so here we have our nth term here, n equals one to infinity, this converges. That is, it converges to a real number, the limit and the limit, limit of the partial sums, we get a real number, does not diverge to infinity or negative infinity. Then, what does that say about the nth term? Well, I think if you, if you think intuitively here, it must say the following. The limit as n approaches infinity of the nth term must be zero. Now, when you think about this, let's just, let's just consider why this would need to be the case. And, and I think this is not at all uh, uh, difficult, at least intuitively. And even the proof is not hard. But when we, when we think about this, we're adding an infinite number of terms. And so if we, if we expect the series to converge, that would imply that what we're adding is actually getting closer and closer to zero. And it would certainly have to be doing it fast enough so that we would get convergence. Cause you could think, you know, you think about when you do derivatives, you do the difference quotient. And you're thinking, well, the numerator better get to zero faster than the denominator or it's going to blow up. So we've, we've already done this with derivatives. We, you know, it's like, okay, so that, that makes sense. And so if you add lots of terms, infinitely many of them, for instance, if you add one to itself infinitely many times, well, that's infinity. I mean, there's no hope for that. I mean, you know, when we study arithmetic sequences in pre-cal, I mean, it's kind of fun, but ba basically useless. I mean, for doing certain finite operations, the arithmetic sequence is useful, but it would never converge. I mean, <laughs> the, the thing is, is the common difference is a number. The number doesn't converge to zero. So, so the idea is that, this, this really is a result that makes intuitive sense to us. And just like the derivative, it has to be happening at a rate so that we do get convergence. And so this is, this is one of those deals that, that we basically get for free. So why is this true? Let's look at this. Now by hypothesis, this is gonna be like the last theorem. By hypothesis, there exists, I'll state this a little bit way, a little bit different way, fixed A element of R such that in this particular case, we can just say that, you know, 
the sum is A, just like we did for the last one. It's less than infinity, but we're just gonna give it a, a, a symbol. So it's a convergent series. Then what we can do is now think of the partial sums associated with this to give us an expression for the nth term a sub n. So here's what we're gonna do, just very simple. We're going to write the nth partial sum, k equals one to n of a sub k, okay? And then we're going to subtract the s minus one partial sum. So we're gonna take away all of the terms in this sum here, except for the last one, a sub n. So this is a this is kind of a algebraic manipulation to attack the a sub n or to isolate it. So we get k equals one to n minus one of a sub k. So if we look at this, this by definition is s sub n. And then of course, certainly doesn't make any difference if we just deal with n minus one terms, it ends going to infinity. So, so there's nothing at, at play here except just some algebra. So we can write the nth term of the series as the difference of two partial sums. So we just say difference of partial sums. So now let's apply the limit. <clears throat> Thus, so the limit as n passes to infinity of a sub n, now if you like, we can just focus on the difference of the partial sums. This will be the limit as n approaches infinity of the difference of the partial sums. This result is, is, is very attractive and, and, and very straightforward to prove once you look at this construction. And now of course the limit is linear so we can apply the limit to each of these objects, each of these partial sums. So we have the limit as n passes to infinity of the nth partial sum minus the limit as n passes to infinity of the n minus first partial sum. But of course, both of these have limit A because the original series converges and these are the associated partial sums. So this will just equal by hypothesis A, this will be A with a negative sign and that's clearly zero. So what's nice about this theorem is that you might be looking at this and say, okay, so what? So how's that gonna help me out? So I can go back and look at the ones that converge and, and verify this. So is that, is that gonna make me better off? And I'll say probably not. I mean, except for the fact that you'll know a little bit more about convergent series, but if we flip it around to the contrapositive, it's actually extremely useful. So what we have here is a, an hypothesis implies a conclusion, P implies Q. So, you know, back in the dark ages, uh, students used to take logic courses. Well, I mean, they still do. Uh, Professor Amen at the North Campus uh, teaches logic, he does philosophy. And so that's a, that's a very nice course. Uh, at uh, University of North Carolina, Texas A&M, uh, they had a logic course, a very intense symbolic logic course that could be used as a math elective if the students so opted. And, I think a lot of students would take it, then they regretted that it, it was so challenging that, that uh, they would have preferred to just take a standard math class, but, but they learned a lot. And so students would say, yes, it was a very useful course. So, so when we look at the conditional, that is P implies Q, an equivalent statement is called the contrapositive. That is not Q <clears throat> implies not P. These are equivalent. So we just proved this statement, but this logical statement that is equivalent to the conditional is called the contrapositive. 
contrapositive. As a math professor, you or you you use the logic that you need, and then I guess the rest of it, it you just don't really worry about. But you know that's just how it is. You 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 use other fields that that are necessary to complete your work. And so now what we can do is we can think of this as p and think of this as q. Now we do not p implies not q. So we can say divergence theorem. So we'll say if we take the negation of this, the little tilde means negation. Sometimes it's like a little bar. It, it, the notation varies, but I'll use this. This means not Q. So if the limit as N approaches infinity of A sub N is not zero. That is when we think about this and we think about the negation of this, if it if it the limit is zero, what would be the negation of that? Well, it'd be that the limit would not be zero. Then what's the negation of converge, diverge? Then the series diverges. So this is easy to negate, so to speak. Now, and we're done with this because this is equivalent to this. And if we prove if we prove this, we've automatically proven that by the equivalency. So, so we don't have, we, we basically now have stated the previous theorem in the form of a divergence theorem. And this is, this is what students find very useful. So, so if, you're, if you look at a problem and uh, you're asked to determine convergence or divergence of an infinite series, one of the, one of the first things you can all just check and put aside is to check the limit of the nth term, the nth term. If it is not zero, then your work is done, okay? So, so many times students will forget that fact and start working and think, oh gosh, I, I, this is so tedious kind of thing. So, so just look at, now I'm, I'm telling you, put this you know, along with the telescoping and the geometric, Okay, and then all those special limits and the ideas we talked about sequences, put this down as one of your convergence tests. And there'll be a nice summary of these tests at the end, uh, towards the end of this uh, chapter. But this is a very useful result and is often overlooked. Okay, so, so before you start applying more complicated convergence tests, first look at the nth term here that we find here and see if this is true. If it's not, then, then you're done. So, so I, would, I would say that there are often theories in more complicated mathematical discussions that aren't difficult. That is, sometimes they're so, they're so simple that you just forget about them. So it, it's almost like when you're doing a, a, an integration problem and you've got a nice factorization that would simplify the integral, but you just overlook it because it's simple. But then you find out later that, well, had I done that, it would have made the problem very straightforward. Okay, so, so again, put this on your note card. You know, it, again, it's real easy. And I'm gonna throw out some of these as we work to the integral test and, and see if it, if it sunk in, okay? So again, very important result. So you could, you could make up a whole list of, of divergent series and try to trick your friends and say, oh, see, test the convergence here. And, and, and the whole time you're thinking, hmm, I wonder if they remember the divergence test. Okay, so let's look at some examples. Now, this next problem, uh, you can actually do a simpler way, but I wanna, I wanna do it using the geometric series to give you some practice. So what we want to do is write the repeating decimal, write the repeating decimal, it's a good example, as a fraction. 
And when I say fraction, fraction of integers. You know, like we say five over nine or something, a fraction of integers. I mean, lots of fractions. You can get fractions of everything. You have one over square root of two, but I want fraction of integers. So here we go. Uh, we have 0.2, one five with the one five repeating. So, so when we look at this number, we think about this as being 0.2, one five, one five, one five, one five, one five at infinitum. And so what we found is that when we have numbers like this written in decimal form that either terminate or have a repeating unit, we know that those can be written or they express rational numbers, which are a ratio or fraction of integers. Uh, the thing that we have no, that we have proven is that functions or, or decimal expansions that do not terminate, nor do they repeat like pi and e, do not have, do not have uh, expressions in terms of a ratio of two integers. And those are what we call, of, co of course, the transcendental numbers. Okay, so, so when, we, when we think about that, and of course, there's, a, there's more to it than that, because of course, we can't write the square root of two as a ratio of two integers, but it's not transcendental, it's algebraic. So transcendental numbers are even a higher level up. But if you want a good example, just, just remember to yourself that if you've got something like this, we can certainly write it uh, as a fraction of two integers. So let me just show you a technique that uses the geometric series so you get some practice with it. So first, we've just got the point two here plus, 0 0.015. So if we just break this up into two pieces, we know that this is going to go on forever and, and create something, a geometric series, but this is fixed. So 0.2, that's just 10, excuse me, 2 over 10, which is 1 fifth. And now if we look at this, let's just go ahead and write it out. We're thinking again that this, this goes on and on and on. So let's just break it up into units. So zero, one, five, and then tack on three zeros, one, five, and then tack on five zeros, two, three, four, five, one, five, et cetera. So when you look at something like this, you're gonna add more strings of zeros and it's just gonna keep going and keep going and keep going. Now, one thing that's interesting about this is that we can think of doing a factoring method. That is this 0 0.015 we can factor and then figure out basically what the A is and also figure out what the actual uh, common ratio is just to make it a little easier. Otherwise, otherwise you could say, well, you know, uh, that could be my A and then we multiply by what? We add two more zeros, multiply by one over a hundred. But we can actually simplify it more than that to make the computation easier. So let's do this. So now we see this part is a geometric series, geometric series. So we have one fifth. So I'm going to factor the point zero one five. So what's that going to leave behind? We're going to have a one. And then of course, to get this number, we have to tack on two more zeros. So this will be one over a hundred. That'll give us that number. And here we need to tack on two more zeros than we had here. So that'll be one over 10,000, et cetera. So this is just a way of making the, the calculation a little bit easier. Again, this is now geometric. Now let's just go ahead and simplify things. So this will be one fifth. And let's just go ahead and write this as a fraction. 
this will be 15 divided by 1,000. Now, what do we have here? Again, for the geometric, we have the first term A is one, and the common ratio, of course, will be one over 100. So we can use the notation that we adopted at the very beginning. So we could say N equals one, to infinity, and we'll have one over 100. You can put a one there for the A, you don't need to, N minus one, right there. Okay, so that's using the notation that we adopted uh, when we started writing the geometric series. Of course, we could change the index and make it look different, and we will in the class. But since we started with this, I'll go ahead and use it. So now, now we're thinking, okay, well, we can sum this because we have a formula. And then of course we can reduce this. So this will be one fifth. And of course, these are both divisible by five. So we get a three. And of course, five into uh, the 10 will be a two, add on two zeros. And now remember the geometric series is A divided by one minus R, the sum. Now, of course, A is one and R is one over 100, just like that. So now, now we, can, we can reduce this to a nice fraction, so let's do it. So we get one fifth. Again, there's a simpler way to do this, but it doesn't give you practice with the geometric series, so I'm not gonna talk about it. I want you to learn how to do this because I want you to be able to manipulate geometric series. And so now we have one, now, if you get a common denominator of 100 here, just think 100, we have 100 minus 1. So that's just going to be 99 over 100. So now we get 1 fifth plus 3 divided by 200. And now, of course, we invert and multiply, so we get 100 divided by 99. So let's go ahead and finish it. So we've got one fifth plus, now what we can see is that the 100 absorbs into the 200. So that gives us a one half and the three absorbs into the 99. So that gives us one over 33. So these are all relatively prime. So we have one fifth plus one over two times 33. So just like I was telling my pre-cal kids, we we're doing trig yesterday and they, they were having struggling with common denominators. And I said, I said, don't make it harder than it is. So we got what two times five times 33. And so of course we need the two times the 33 here. And here we just need the five since we have the two and the 33. So that, of course, that'll be a 66 plus a five. And then of course, that's a 10 times a 33. So we just tack on a zero, 330. So that'll be what, uh, a one, so a 71 over 330. So when you look at a problem like this, in terms of the geometric series, it's just an academic exercise. Again, there are simpler ways to do this and, and, and that's fine, but that I, I could teach that method to, to kids in an algebra one class. That's just a nice little trick method, which, which is fine. It's coherent mathematics, but I want you to learn how to work with geometric series because the geometric series is extremely important in analysis and uh, uh, engineering mathematics or any STEM mathematics. And so you need to be able to manipulate it. Uh, it's unfortunate that, that when you need the geometric series, the, the theory is not there because you haven't practiced with it enough. And of course, this would be a problem you could do in pre-cal and I usually teach it, but Again, by the time I get to series in pre-cal, I think my students have, they've just, they've given out because they're so tired. 
But again, if you look at this, this, this does require calculus because it does require the sum of an infinite series, but you can actually uh, give the sum, you know, derive the formula for the uh, partial sum in pre-cal, even though the kids don't have the luxury of the calculus, they still can use the uh, formula. Um, so, so again, look at this as just a means of utilizing the geometric series and practicing <clears throat> with the strategies that come up. You can, you can write your geometric series any way you like, ladies and gentlemen, you can factor it. It, it doesn't matter. As long as you assign the A and the R correctly, then you're, you're good to go. That's where students fall down, <clears throat> excuse me. And when you index things, you need to make sure that whatever your indices uh, command, that they actually uh, do represent what you have here. And you can see that we have that. So that's important too. Um, and of course, we'll spend time manipulating things as necessary. Now, there was one other example. Let's see, what did I do with that? Yeah, here we go. Uh, of a, another geometric series. Yeah, all of these are all of these are geometric because I think they we deserve to, to study that. And then of course we'll talk about the integral test. So uh, here's one. Here's a simple one. So I'll just say compute the sum. So we've got the series n equals one to infinity of negative one fifth to the n minus one. Of course, this is written this is written in the way we did previously, but it doesn't matter. You can always figure out the a and the uh, the r. Now, notice here um, we can look at this. We can look at the nth term, and we clearly see that the nth term, this, this corresponds to the, the special limit. The nth term does converge to zero, but we have to remember that doesn't mean anything. The, in, in that form, we can't say, oh, the series converges. No, it doesn't mean that. We just know if the series converges, then the nth term must converge to zero. So if we were gonna to try to use the divergence test here, we'd say, well, there's no, there's no hope in using that because that nth term does converge to zero because the R is negative one fifth and that in absolute value is less than one. So, so we can't use the, 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 that type of reasoning to ever show convergence, that, that is completely false. But we can look at this and say, this is geometric. And so now, First, we'll say geometric, very simple. And then of course, now, if we look at this, we see that the A is one. When N is equal to one, we just get the negative one fifth to the zero power, which is one. So A is one and R is clearly negative one fifth. So we know this is convergent and we can say convergent. So now we can use the theorem, which says A divided by one minus R. So we have one, one minus negative one fifth. These make great problems uh, with, with physics and all about bouncing balls and things I do with my pre-calculus class. Uh, again, they're, they're fun. So of course, this will be one plus a one fifth. So we get one over common denominator six fifths. So we just reciprocate and get five six. So, so again, one thing we wanna remember is that, that oftentimes we overlook the geometric series. And we, we think, you know, because as we learn convergence test, you're gonna say, oh, I can apply this convergence test or I can apply this one. Um, and then we forget the fact that we have a simple geometric series that, that, that would, would be a lot more straightforward, but it doesn't matter. It's kind of like doing an integral. Um, you know, if you consider one technique as opposed to another, it might be that you just like that technique or you find it easy to, to execute. Now, the very last example is this, and then we're gonna discuss the integral test. So it says, 
compute values <clears throat> for which the series converges. <clears throat> And then what is the sum? So in this case, we have the following series. We have n equals one to infinity, in this case of six x to the n. So this is written a little bit differently. Uh, we have a different uh, power here, but that doesn't matter. We, we just, we use the construct that we're given and work with that. So now what we're seeing here is that we do have a geometric series, but now it's, it's, it's basically uh, a power series because we have powers of X and we're gonna, we're gonna study power series quite you know, seriously uh, towards the end of this chapter and you will enjoy that. So it'll be the next step above the infinite series where now we look at a series of power functions, which, which is more difficult. So, so the idea here is that we look at this and say when n equals one, we get six x. And then of course, when n equals two, we get six x quantity squared. And then of course, plus six x quantity cubed. So this is definitely geometric. So now of course, when n is equal to one, the first term a is six x. But then of course, to get to the second term, we just multiply by six X. So R is six X. So if we look at this as a geometric series, which is, of course it is, then this implies, we'll just say, let me write it this way. For convergence, and this is our theorem, our special limit for convergence, uh, R, which equals in absolute value six X in absolute value, which is just what six times the absolute value of X must be less than one. So this will just imply if and only if the absolute value of X is less than one sixth. So this will define the values of X uh, for which the series converges. So equivalently, if we just write the conjunction as a compound inequality, we would say negative one six, less than X, less than one six. So that would give us the values of X for which this series would converge. And then of course, now we can write the sum in terms of X. So now N equals one to infinity of six X to the N will just be A over one minus uh, R. So A, well, A and R are the same. So we get six X divided by one minus six X. So, so the, the geometric series is, is really a plus um, and, it, and it has so, so many wide reaching consequences <clears throat> in what we plan to do with infinite series. And you'll be amazed at how often we depend on the geometric series. And then you might be thinking, this is starting to be as important as the Pythagorean theorem you think, well, what would we do without it? And I know I say this all the time, but, but we get accustomed to <clears throat> the actual structures in mathematics that are very useful. And uh, so that's why when I say um, we're gonna use the geometric series more, it's important to get as much practice with it as you can, because it may be manipulated, you know, you re-index things and think about things in different contexts. You need to have that foundation down. So again, very straightforward, but very useful. Now, the next topic I mentioned in passing at the last lecture is the integral test. I wanna, wanna state it and then look at some examples and then go back and maybe talk about why it's actually a valid, valid statement. Let me adjust the chair here. So, the, you're thinking, okay, right now we've got these telescoping series, which turned out to have very simple uh, partial sums. And because of the telescoping uh, characteristic, all of these terms absorb and we're left with a 
partial sum that's easy to evaluate. We saw that with the partial fraction decomposition problem. And then we also saw that with the, the geometric. That's what allowed us to get that nice formula, A divided by one minus R. So, so that's, that's a luxury, okay? Now, most, most convergence uh, tests are not that nice, but, but this next one is very robust in the sense that it's um, uh, still a quite an uh, important test that's very useful. And this will be the integral test. So this is 9.3 integral test. So this is what I talked about when we did improper integrals. Uh, since we're going to have this infinity bit, this will, this will rely on improper integrals. So that's why we had our section covering the improper integrals because we need that for this particular test. So here's the theorem. So suppose for x greater than or equal to one, so for instance, in this type of problem, we'll just, we'll, we'll make sure that our hypotheses are satisfied We'll, we'll compute certain things and then, then see that this is satisfied and we'll be good to go. So for X greater than or equal to one, or at least eventually, we're gonna need the function F. So the function F is positive, continuous, and decreasing. So, so basically, when we think about this, you, you look at this as maybe applying some calculus. We'd say, okay, well, we've got lots of nice theorems about continuity of functions, and we have nice, nice theorems for decreasing functions using the derivative. And then with the positive, we've got like a sign test, a BB test, or maybe it'll just be clearly obvious that it's positive. So, so we, we may just go ahead and act like we're in pre-cal and do all of that and then add some calculus and say, okay, here's the set of continuity. Well, it includes that. Okay, we're good. Here's the set for which the function is decreasing. Oh, okay, it includes that. And here's the set for which the function is uh, positive. Oh, oh, it includes that. So, so what we're doing is that we're applying techniques from calculus one and techniques from pre-cal to make sure that we have this. And then if we have this, we can move to the next level. So here's what we want to do. We want to define the nth term. And if, you know what it's gonna be. It's just gonna be the function evaluated at n. So, so the idea here is that we're thinking about what we did in sequences where if we have a limit at infinity existing, we can move that to the sequence and have the same limit, okay? So, so what we wanna do here is we've got this nice function that has all these good characteristics. And then, just like I said before, we take the function and we move to the sequence. We just restrict to the natural numbers. And then from this, we create an infinite series. And then, then the, the punchline is gonna say, when does that series actually converge? And this is the, the result. Then, and this is very robust that we don't get theorems this nice. The infinite series that's made from the function f converges. Now, of course, you think we've got all these nice uh, attributes for f. Continuity means that it's Riemann integrable. It's a decreasing function, it's positive. So it's basically going to say that this series will converge if and only if the improper integral converges. Now, we can use improper integrals to estimate, get error estimates on the sum. This doesn't give anything about the sum. It basically just says that if 
we have an infinite series and we stare at the nth term and say, hmm, okay, think about the real value function. Oh, are these hypotheses satisfied? And they say they are, okay. Then we check out the improper integral. So it's kind of, it's a tiered checklist. Then we check out the improper integral and we say, oh, okay, the improper integral converges. All right, now we can back up and say, the original series converges. So this is where we, we start with the nth term, which is a sequence. And we move to the real valued function and establish some hypotheses from that. And then we can move back to the series and say, well, this is what happened. So this is a very, very robust test in the sense that, that it all hinges on this computation here. Again, we have to make sure that all of these are satisfied, but then we have what is very much a robust test. So you're thinking that's easy to remember. And the only thing that you have to really think about is are these hypotheses. So before I talk about <clears throat> the actual proof, of this, I just want to do an example and then talk about some other results that follow from this uh, that will be useful to us. <clears throat> so let's just do a simple example of this so you can see this at work. So we're going to start with, with uh, let's see here, that, that would be a good one, but you, you, would, you would tell me that that would be an easy one, so I'm not going to do that one. Um, here, let me do let me do this one. Okay, so we're going to start with the series, and this is the authors being kind of mean to you. They're going to write it in terms of a sum without the the sigma and the the ends, and we'll just work backwards. So we have one third, <clears throat> one fifth, one seventh, one ninth. 111th, all adding, so we've developed a pattern here. So, so when we look at this, we're thinking, okay, this would be an easy pattern. These are just odd numbers in the denominator. So we're taking reciprocals of odd numbers. So we can think of two n plus one. So we can say this equals the series, n equals one to infinity of one divided by two n plus one, okay? So, so we started here, but then we, of course, we end up with this as, as a more standard means of notating a, a real series, a series of real numbers, an infinite series of numbers. That is, we add up an infinite list of numbers. And then we'll say converge or diverge, question mark. Okay, so when we look at this, we're thinking, well, okay, no, there's not a whole lot of stuff there. It's not telescoping. It's not geometric. So the first thing we want to do is say, okay, well, let's, let's, what test do we have? Well, we, we only have one new test. And so let's try the integral test. So we can let f of x equal one over two x plus one. Remember, all we're doing is following the theorem here. So we make that definition. So, so we first, again, you're thinking if we're going to deal with real functions, maybe go ahead and convert to x and, and just keep in mind that, that as we move back, this connects the f and this, so we can see if we replace x with n, it's exactly that, okay? So that's what we're doing. So now first, we'll say, okay, well, let's note here, th this, is, this is very important. We'll just say, okay, uh, we'll say, at this point, we have a vertical asymptote, just for grins here, x equals negative one half, okay? So we think about this. So we've got negative one half here. And then of course, uh, to the left of negative one half, say negative 10, the function is clearly negative. And then to the right of one half, say positive 10, the function is clearly positive. So we'll say that f is greater than zero for x element of 
what, negative one half to infinity, okay? So that's gonna work. That's actually going to uh, pull in this case. So this will actually work for x greater than or equal to one. So we just go ahead and analyze it like we normally do and say, okay, we're in pre-cal, where's this function positive here? So that's gonna include that, so we're good with that. So we've got the positive part, so we've got positive. And then, of course, this is a rational function. So rational functions are continuous where they are defined. So we say uh, f is continuous for x element of negative infinity to negative one half. So <laughs> calculus one union negative one half to infinity, okay? Well, just like this, this includes that. So get a check for that. I don't, I don't like to say, oh, well, it's continuous for x greater than or equal to one. I don't, I don't really like to state it that way because it's, 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 it's ignoring the, the set of continuity. Determine the continuity. Then, okay, it's gonna work for those values of x. Determine the positivity. Okay, it's going to work for those values of x. Make it like a calculus one problem where it's more formal and, and you're actually speaking the truth, so to speak. All right. So now the last one will be uh, decreasing. Well, what's the best way to do decreasing? Let's just look at the first derivative. So now f equals 2 to the x. I've got a little string on the pen plus one to the negative one, okay? So let's do the computation f prime. In this case, will equal, what do we have? Uh, negative one, two x plus one to the negative two times the derivative of the inner function, which is two. So this gives us negative two divided by two x plus one squared. <clears throat> so when we look at this and we think about this particular example, we're saying, okay, well, this, the denominator is always positive, at least where it's defined. And so the numerator is negative. So we say this is less than zero for <clears throat> X element of, well, back to the same thing, negative infinity, negative one half, union, negative one half to infinity. Of course, this includes the infinite set one to infinity, so check. So we say hypotheses satisfied. So when you use the integral test, most students just, okay, I just wanna jump to the in, indefinite or the uh, improper integral, but you need to validate this. So if I, if I test you when this will be on your next test, then I need to see this, okay? I need to see these computations. Again, they're not difficult computations, but they are important. They are important computations. And you need to be able to work through this just like you're in a calculus one class. I think one student said, I I'm okay as long as I just remember every math that I've learned before this class. And I said, well, kinda, you know. <clears throat> I said, it's important that you know the prerequisites and, and it pretty much started in general math, algebra one, algebra two, Pre-cal, geometry, you know, college algebra, all the pre all the prerequisites are very important for calculus. So it, it I guess that student was speaking the truth. So so now when we have this, we're thinking, okay, so we can move, we've got this. So let's move to this integral here. So now we've got the integral one to infinity of f of x. So if you will, um, let's say, okay, one two x plus one dx. So this is improper. So let me move this up here. I've shifted this down a little bit. So let me, let me do this. There we go. A little bit more room there. But I wanna, I wanna take advantage of all the space I have here. So yeah, let me do this. Cool, that's a little bit better. So now we'll say this is the limit as b approaches infinity of the integral one to b. And now we can go ahead and dress this up. We can think of u equals two x plus one 
So du equals two dx. <clears throat> so now we're gonna need, let's go ahead and dress it up. We'll have two dx <clears throat> over two x plus one. And then of course we'll pay for the, the two with a one half. So this will give us one half limit as B approaches infinity. And now of course, this is table ready. This is just DU over U. So this will be the natural log of the absolute value of two X plus one, <clears throat> one to B. So we have one half <clears throat> limit as B approaches infinity. And so now we can go ahead and apply the fundamental theorem. So this will be natural log of two B plus one minus the natural log. And now of course, X is replaced with one. So that's two plus one. So that's log of three. But now we can see this is fixed, but the natural logarithm is an increasing function. And as B passes to infinity, this becomes infinite. So this is just infinity. So we have one half times infinity, which is infinity. So now when we look at this, when we go back to the theorem, we got our hypothesis satisfied and then we decided to look at the improper integral, but now this diverges. So this must diverge. That's why this theorem is so robust. You, you, get, you get an answer. You get an answer. It's not like, oh man, the hypotheses were satisfied and this, this didn't even work. No, this is a terrific test because if you have the hypotheses, then this computation controls everything. So you get an answer. You don't say, well, I guess I need to use another test because this doesn't work, okay? So this diverges. So by this implies that the given series, and we'll just write it down, the given series n equals one to infinity, one over two n plus one diverges by, and we can abbreviate integral test. So this is one thing that's nice about this test. And one, one word I often use, we say this is a very robust test in the sense that you get an answer. I mean, if you, if you have the hypothesis satisfied, then you get an answer and that's a good thing. Let me adjust this, here we go. You get, you get a good, good solid, uh, result. Now, so that's how that's how you work the integral test. You might be thinking, okay, well, maybe maybe you might have to spend a little bit more time on this, or maybe the improper integral might be harder or easier. Okay, and then of course, you know, you you might find one of some problems in this section that are actually geometric, but the integral test would still work. Okay, and if you want to practice the integral test, do it that way. But you're thinking, okay, well, you know, I've got to get in and get out, you know, um, geometric, I, I can knock that out a lot quicker. So when, when you're learning a new test, uh, use it, okay? But when, you're, when you've got all every, everything just put together, when you've learned a lot of tests, then you get to choose. You say, okay, well, I'm gonna use this test, it applies and it's easy. And so it's kind of like integrals. Once you, when you're learning a new technique, how do you master it? Well, you use it. But then of course, if you have a bunch of things thrown together, you just say, well, I'm gonna try this or I'm gonna use this where you have a uh, complete control over the method. So series are the same way. It's, there's absolutely no difference. Now, what we wanna do, and, and this is what I promised, is there are a couple of results here that follow directly from the integral test that are really important. So we're gonna, we're gonna use them. So here from the P integral, so I told you before, this P integral is gonna turn out to be very useful. From the P integral, we know what? This was an improper integral and the proof was pretty straightforward. We remember that we had the following result, one to infinity, one over x to the p. Remember this was add one divided by the new power. 
actually converges to the number one divided by P minus one, if and only if what? P is greater than one. Okay, so when, when we look at this and we think, oh yeah, okay. Hmm, so, so we're thinking, all right, what, what's going on here? Okay, does this, is this something that is gonna help us out with infinite series? Well, first off, we can notice here uh, for, again, P is bigger than one. Number one, we can say one over X to the P in this particular case will be positive for, we know for sure when in, and, and this is what this is what's important about this. We we think about we think about these these power functions and how they react and how we work with things. So p is greater than one. So we definitely get for x bigger than zero. So that's going to include x greater than or equal to one. So that's a check. So maybe we have p equal to two. Okay or maybe we have P equal to three or P equal to three halves, something like that, okay? And then again, this is a power function. So again, we'll say P is bigger than one, two. So we can, let me just go ahead and write this up here. F of X equals one over X to the P, might as well just, tell it what it is, right? And then we have, in this case, f of x is continuous for, well, as long as we're not dividing by zero, we'll just say x element of negative infinity to zero, union zero to infinity. It's just a power function. And that, that's good too, because that includes x greater than or equal to one. And then now, of course, here P is bigger than one. F of x equals x to the negative P. So this implies F prime of x equals negative P times x to the, in this case, negative P plus one. Now, of course, P is, is bigger than one, so this is gonna run downstairs. So this is gonna be negative P over X to the one minus P. Now, and this is less than zero or again, if we just avoid, um, in this case, uh, the zero, we'll say X element of zero to infinity. And this includes X greater than or equal to one. So we'll say hypotheses satisfied. So now we're thinking, all right, We've already done the integral. All we had to do is make sure that the hypotheses work. So now we use the P integral. By P integral, the infinite series now of course we'll make the change. Remember now F of N will be a sub n, which will be one over n to the p. And we're gonna call this the p series. So we'll say n equals one to infinity of one over n to the p converges for p greater than one. And we call this the p series. Otherwise it diverges. And we say P series. 
So we get infinitely many convergent series from the integral test by just using the P integral that we computed with the what? Improper integral section. So, so again, what we see, we, we basically kind of get this for free. I mean, you, you're thinking, oh, this must be satisfied, but we do have to check it. We have to make sure. So pick your favorite P like two, and, and then we got one over X squared. And then of course we have one over X squared here. And then we have uh, X to the negative two, which will give us what, uh, so when we subtract, when we add, uh, oh, let's see here. Um, I think, oh, you, you all think I'm losing my mind. If you look here, when we do the prime, of course we bring, we do the minus P and then we subtract one. I'm glad I checked through this, sorry about that. We subtract one, that's the power function or the power rule, forgive me. So here we've got this. This is what we call the, the what is it? The power rule, yeah, power rule. Power rule. And so now when you think about this, that will just give us a negative two over X cubed. And that gives us the sign here. So pick, pick your favorite value of P to think about these. And then of course, Professor Ron will be sure uh, to use the uh, power rule correctly. So, so again, remember X to the N prime is n x to the n minus one. So we, we, yeah, we always need to make sure we apply the power rule correctly. So, so now, now we can look at this and say that this computation does actually mean something to us. That is this integral uh, converging plus with the hypotheses of the integral test now gives us infinitely many convergent series. So as long as the P is bigger than one, you can use this series as a source of comparison, okay? So <clears throat> when we get to more elaborate tests, and I won't say actually more elaborate tests, but different tests, there'll be opportunities where you compare one series to another. And the, the, the neat thing that will happen as part of the theorem will be that if you make this comparison and this limit occurs, then the series do the same thing. And so this gives you a nice collection of convergent series to use as a source of comparison. So, so this, this is a major result, okay? This is a major result. This, this will give you help when, when other things will not, okay? So, so this result that we get directly from the P integral and the integral test gives us much help in the future. Now, with that, we also have a famous divergent series. So the next one or the next result is when P equals one. P equals one. We know we got the same stuff here, basically, P equals one. We know that the integral one to infinity, one over X dx is infinite. That is, it diverges. So when we think of, of one over X, we, you know, we just take P equal to one here, we've got one. So we've got the negative here, all of this runs through. So we it, here just replace P with one, we get this. We replace uh, P with one with the continuity, we get this. We replace P with one, we get the same thing. So I'll just say replace P with one in the above arguments. Okay, so we don't have to do it again. Then this implies now the series, so replace P with one. This is so easy. I mean, it, it you know, it's so easy that it, it seems like it, it, it can't be, but it is. So one over N, 
Now, this is infinite, so by the integral test, diverges. And of course here, we just say by integral test, you knew that, but let me write it in, diverges by integral test. So this, is, this has a, a name. This series is called the harmonic series. Harmonic series. Harmonic series. So you're thinking, how do we get all this good stuff basically for free? Well, it is free pretty much. We, we use our basic calculus one techniques here to get the convergent P series. And then we apply the same argument basically to the fact when P is equal to one, and then we get this series. And so what's interesting, what's interesting about, about this particular one is that it also adds a nice source of comparison. That is, if you start to compare series and their nth terms, this is a very useful construct. And let me just say this, note that one over n does proceed to zero. That is, note the limit as n approaches infinity of one over n does equal zero. But see, we know that doesn't mean anything. That doesn't apply convergence. We know if a series converges then the nth term must converge to zero. So if you look at this and say, oh, one over n goes to zero, it converges, that's patently false. So don't, don't even think about that. And if you do that on a test, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna say, please, please don't make that mistake. And I might, might write a few words. I've said this a million times. The nth term does not say anything about the convergence in the sense that if it converges to zero here, that's not telling you anything. Clearly what we have here is that this is not getting small fast enough, okay? But when you click up the power greater than one, it does. That's the theory, that's the mathematics at work. So when you look at this and say, well, why does this diverge? Don't say some ridiculous argument here. This, this implies, I'll just say, this does not imply convergence. So remember that, put that on your note card. If, the, if this goes to zero, the nth term, that doesn't, doesn't say anything. You have no conclusion there. So if you look at this and you start scratching your head, no, 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 we've solved this. This is the integral test. This is the P integral that diverges, okay? So when you look at this, do not ever apply this argument to any kind of convergence. It, it will never work and it's completely false, okay? So this is why I like the integral test because it gives us so much power that we can use with later tests. So the integral test is, is I love what the author does. Uh, Dr. Larson puts the integral test in section three so it gives you all these nice results that you can use in section four, five, et cetera. So <clears throat> again, very, very powerful. Now we're gonna learn, we're gonna learn some uh, tests that are very, very algebraic and you're gonna really like them because they'll be fun, okay? So, so not all of this is gonna be tedious. You know, we check all of these things, it gets a little bit more tedious, but we see that the tedium was worth it because we've got some really nice results now. So we have the divergent harmonic series and we have the convergent P series when P is bigger than one, which directly mimics the P integral as long as we make sure all the other stuff is satisfied uh, here. Okay, so good. Now, let's look at another example. So I wanted to make sure that you have these results. They're very important. Now, the next result has something to do with the, uh, basically estimating a series with the integral test. So I wanna say a little bit about this. And this is very straightforward. We can use the partial sum. 
when I was looking through this, I said, I need to, I need to say this and I need to talk about these things because these are gonna give you more insight. Let's say the partial sum that has, we'll use a uppercase N that many terms to approximate Say we don't have a geometric series, so we don't have a nice formula for the sum to approximate S, and this is gonna be the sum of the series for fixed or fixed N element of R when N is bigger than one. So what we say is that S is just the sum of the infinite series, the convergent sum. So that's kind of a shorthand notation here. And then of course, S sub N is just the partial sum, just like we've done before, K equals one to N of A sub K, okay? So the same notation that we've used before, it's just that we don't normally use S, that, so this is kind of new. If we're just thinking about the sum of the convergent infinite series, we'll use the S without a subscript. I guess we could like write S infinity if you wanted, but that's not required. So then let's look at the remainder. So we've got a positive term series. Notice, notice, and we, and I haven't been focusing on this a lot, but all the terms are positive. So we say positive term series. Okay, that's a big, that's a big hypothesis. We we do need that. Otherwise, this doesn't work. So we're going to say the remainder, if we use the nth partial sum, will just be S, the real sum, minus the nth partial sum. So that would be the remainder if we were using this to actually approximate the sum. So let's write down what these are. We have the, uh, the notation right here. So we have N equals 1 to infinity A sub N minus in this case, and, and if you like, here, here notice here, ladies and gentlemen, I don't, I'm not using a lowercase n, so I can make these ends too. Let's just go ahead and make them ends. Let's make them ends. Because I'm I'm using an uppercase n there, so I'll just use ends there. That'll work. Keep it easy. And so we're going to shave off the first n terms. So we'll start with n plus one. And now if we think about the decreasing function, this will correspond an upper bound to the following improper integral. Because again, the function is decreasing, we get these nice limits here, uh, n one to n of f of x dx. So this is an upper bound. So if and only if, we can just add S sub N to all the sides. S sub N will be less than or equal to the actual sum. We'll just go ahead and write it out. And then we have S sub N plus the improper integral. So if we were interested in figuring out the bounds for instance, we'd say that our infinite series lives between these two numbers. The sum lives between these two numbers. And then, then this, is, this is a very nice result because we'll see it again. We're thinking if we want to see an upper bound on the error, we can use this. And of course, this will be more than the actual error, but at least gives us an upper bound. So, so what's nice about this is that maybe you use a certain number of terms to figure out uh, how good your approximation is. You compute this, and then you're thinking, well, my error is not so bad, I can live with it. And then if you form this inequality between the S of N and the sum of S of N and the improper integral, then, then basically what you get is a nice interval that includes or that contains the actual sum. And so, of course, you know, if you've got your uh, uh, computer algebra system or your, uh, you've got a program that you write, a lot of times in engineering, you'll write programs to, 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 to sum some things. You could say, okay, well, 
well, for this particular uh, series, I've got uh, I've got a uh, sum that that's good to three decimals, and that's fine if you're doing an engineering project or you're building a bridge. You may find that this is more than sufficient, and of course, that's that's where the engineers have to rely upon their knowledge of calculus to make sure that their calculations are correct. I mean, you know, you can a computer can spit out all kinds of numbers, but do they are they correct and do they even make sense? So so this. This actually goes back to the discussion of basically, why do we need this decreasing function? Why do we need continuous? Why do we need positive? Well, it's all bound up in this because that's where we get the connection between the partial sum and the Riemann sum being equal. And that's why we can sandwich the improper integral the way we've done here. So, so all of this hinges on the hypotheses. So if we don't have the hypotheses, we don't really need to even worry about the improper integral. Now, let's look at an example. I've got an example here that uses this last result that I think will be interesting for us. So I wanna do a simple example with this. So now let's look at this. So I'll get an extra sheet of paper and we'll have this ready for us. So let me move this up so you can still see that right there. So let's consider uh, the following example. Say we have, and I'll keep the numbers fairly small. Example, we'll say approximate. So this is good for you future engineers. You'll like this. Approximate the sum with three terms and give an upper bound, give an upper bound for the error. Now, when we, when we look at this and we think about this, we're thinking, okay, well, we need a series and here's the series that Professor Ron has used. So we're gonna have N equals three and we've got the following P series. Now there's some really nice Fourier analysis techniques that you can use to sum these, but that'll have to wait until you do your uh, Fourier analysis with your partial differential equations. But that's some beautiful theory and it connects a lot of these P series where the power is an integer uh, to the Fourier analysis. So. Let's do S sub three. So we'll have note here, here's our A sub N. So A sub N equals one over N to the fourth. So we get one over one to the fourth plus one over two to the fourth plus one over three to the fourth. So that's using the first three terms as an approximation to the sum. So this gives us one over one plus one, two to the fourth, 16, plus three to the fourth, that's what, nine times nine, 81. So we've got what, 16 times 81. So this gives us what, 16 times 81 plus 81 plus 16. So now let's go ahead and get our approximation. Let's clean it up a little bit. So this will be what? This will be uh, what 10. So that'll be 810 plus six times 81 plus and now that'll be a seven, a 97, right? We add those two numbers. And then of course, downstairs, we have 810, 10 times 81 plus six times 81. So let's see, that's gonna be a seven and that'll be a zero and then a one, 907. And so that'll be, let's see, that's a six, four, eight, six. 
And so here we have 810 plus 486. So let's add it up so we get a 13, a 9, and a 13. And then, of course, here we get a 6, we get a 9, and a 12. So we get 1393 divided by 1296 is our approximation if we use the first three terms. And now we want an error bound. So we know the improper integral will give us the error bound. So now we'll say the integral in this particular case, let me show you again. And, oh, I knew I, knew I had a typo here. We're thinking, where'd the infinity go? Into infinity. Let me fix this and you can fix this in your notes. How funny. So to mimic this, we need, we're using the decreasing nature of the, of the function f and so we can actually start our integral at n because again, we have a decreasing function to infinity. So I flip these around, forgive me. This will be n to infinity, n to infinity. So go back in your notes and make sure this is written correctly because this is an improper integral as it should be. And so now we take this integral to get an approximation on the error. What, what's an upper bound for the difference between the actual sum and the uh, approximation? So now we get three to infinity. And notice here, f of x is one over x to the fourth, which is x to the negative fourth. So we get x to the negative fourth dx. So this gives us the limit as b passes to infinity of 3 to b. And we don't, this is just the power rule, so we don't have anything to dress up. So we equals what? We've got the limit as b approaches infinity. Add 1, divide by the new power. So we have what? Negative 1 third x to the negative three. Again, add one, divide by the new power, three to b. So we can factor. So we have negative one third, the limit as b approaches infinity. So let's go ahead and write this as one over x to the third power to make it a little bit easier to evaluate. So this will give us negative one third now we have the limit as b passes to infinity. So we have one over b to the third minus, again, we'll have three to the third, that'll be 27. And now of course we just have one over b cubed as b passes to infinity. This limit will clearly be zero and that'll leave us with negative one third times zero minus one over 27. And so this will be a negative times a negative. So three times 27, one over 81. So that would be an upper bound on the error for this particular approximation. So now if and only if, so we can use this as the lower bound. So 13, nine, three, 12, nine, six, our series, we'll just write it in, n equals one to infinity, our p series, n to the fourth, between these two numbers, 13, nine, three, 12, nine, six, plus one over 81. So this is what, this is what we're doing right here. So when you look at this, and let me just let me just bend this so it's right there. So we're comparing our calculation here to get a interval for the actual series. And see, so we see Sn, S3 here, 
1,393 divided by 1,296, the actual series, and then of course, the S sub three plus the error. So we know for a fact that our series sum exists between these two numbers. And of course, if we want to refine this, we can use larger values of n. So, so what, what we have usually, ladies and gentlemen, in general, is that we have to approximate the actual sum. If we know it converges, then, then we can use the theory to get a nice approximation. And again, this is why we did the improper integrals uh, in the previous section. So, so when it comes to the integral test, not only do we have the harmonic series, the P series, but then we get this nice inequality here to approximate the uh, actual sum and then not only figure out the error, but to create the interval that contains the actual sum. And this is a very, very nice result. Again, this is tied up in the theorem proof, which if I have time at the next lecture, I'll say something about. But I thought it was important to, to do this. Now, I have one other example that I want to look at that we can uh, go through. And this is an integral test. It's like doing integrals. I mean, it, it keeps you busy, but it's, it's, it's doable. So here's an example. Let's look at this series. So if you want to, if you want to actually look at the proof of this, it's written up very nicely in the lecture notes on Blackboard. Uh, but I felt like I needed to get into this pretty quickly and do some examples so you have good, good examples for your notes. Now, if we look at this, we think converge or diverge. Converge or diverge. Well, notice the first thing, like I said before, we've got a perfect square here. So we have n equals one to infinity. So we have n, so we have n squared plus one quantity squared. So now you look at this and say, well, it doesn't have any of the properties that we notice with the telescoping, but we can think about trying to apply the integral test. So at this point, what we wanna do is f of x equals x over x squared plus one quantity squared. Now, again, we can look at this and say, number one, as long as x is greater than zero, we can say f of x is positive for x greater than zero. The denominator is always positive, and so that certainly satisfies x greater than or equal to one, so that's good. Two, f is continuous where it is defined, it's a rational function. Cal one, f is continuous for x element of r. So all these calculus one theories are really nice for us. So boom, that gives it to us. Again, we, we know this includes x greater than or equal to one. Now, what about decreasing? Well, it appears that it's decreasing. Let's check the derivative. F prime, let's just apply the quotient rule. So that'll be one times x squared plus one quantity squared minus x. Now take the derivative, two times x squared plus one to the first power times the derivative of the inner function 2x. And then of course we square this, x squared plus one to the fourth. So now of course we can just factor, we've got a copy of x squared plus one in all of these terms. So we have x squared plus one to the first power. And of course that leaves behind a copy of x squared plus one. And then of course here we have a negative 2x times a 2x, so that's a negative 4x squared. So easy, quotient rule. So now of course, one of these absorbs into here and this gives us what, uh, so let's add, so we've got negative three X squared right here, plus a one. 
And then we've got three copies of the x squared plus one. That's still positive, so no problem there. And then, of course, we can factor the negative three. So that's an x squared minus a one third. And then, of course, that's a difference of two squares. So we have negative three x minus one over the square root of three. It's like we're doing the unit circle x plus one over the square root of three. So now when we look at this, we're thinking, okay, well, this is good. Um, we've got the BBs here. So we've got what? Negative one over the square root of three. We have one over the square root of three. And of course, in between is where we have an issue. So if we're at like zero, then this will be negative and this will be positive. So positive here, but clearly negative in these regions. So we can say this is less than zero if and only if x lives between what? Negative infinity, negative one square root three. Again, very easy calculus one. I mean, that we, we, we live for calculus one because it, it gives us all the rudiments that we need to do Cal two. And so this is negative, so this implies F is decreasing by the increasing decreasing, F is decreasing there. And of course that includes X greater than or equal to one. So that's a check. I mean, even if we didn't have one, if, if, if it were true eventually, we'd be fine. Throwing off a couple of terms won't, won't matter with the convergence. So now we can apply the integral test. So let's look at the uh, improper integral. So we have one, no, we, well, we're applying the integral test. Now let's look at the integral, which now makes sense to look at. So we have the one to infinity of what X. And so we've got X squared plus one quantity squared DX. So now when we look at this, we're thinking, okay, this is add one divided by the new power. Always, always good. So U equals X squared plus one du equals 2x dx. So let's first dress it up just for, just for grins. Uh, so this will be 1 half, 1 to infinity. You can do it in any order you like. I'll just change it up just to, just to show you that it doesn't really matter. We can do it in any order we like, negative 2. And then we've got what? 2x dx. So that, that part is table ready. So now, we have what one half the limit as B approaches infinity of one to B X squared plus one to the negative two, two X DX. So table ready, so we can apply the antiderivative. So this will equal one half limit as B passes to infinity so add one divided by the new power. So the new power is negative one. So we have a negative one. And then of course we have X squared plus one to the negative one, one to B. So we can factor the negative. So we get a negative one half limit as B approaches infinity. And so now we can fill everything in. So we have one over B squared plus one, just with the negative one. And then we have minus, and then of course one squared plus one, that's one plus one, which is two. Okay, very simple. And now of course, as B passes to infinity, uh, the denominator grows uh, to infinity relative to the numerator. And that again is zero. So that's one half, zero minus one half, so negative one half times negative one half is one fourth. And of course this converges. So now what we can see with this particular problem is that by the integral test, the original series must therefore converge. So this implies that the original series N equals one, I'll go ahead and write it with the completed square, uh, N, N squared plus one squared converges.
and we'll say by integral test. So, so the key here, ladies and gentlemen, is basically just a little litmus test. Um, the integral test, students say, well, oh, the integral test is so long, it, it takes forever, you know, I mean, well, I, I'll say this, the, the, the longest part about the integral test will probably be computing the improper integral. Um, the decreasing part, again, you, you, you need to verify that using some calculus, that usually the positive and the continuous part is just a, a, a quick reference to pre-cal and cal one. So, so again, as you do this, um, just remember that the integral test gives rise to all of these nice results that now are going to help us in the sequel. So just remember, and, and like I say, if you are interested, the actual proof, the actual proof of the integral test is also in the notes. And I may, I'll put this, put this page uh, on the lecture uh, recording page so you'll have the proof. It's very simple. This, this proof is easy. And I wanted to get to the uh, uh, ideas about the integral test first. And so I'll post this so you'll have this. This, and of course, the second part uses the contrapositive. And so there's really nothing to do, but I'll, I'll post this so you have this. And it's also in my lecture notes uh, on Blackboard. So, so the, idea, the idea with the integral test, just like with the geometric series, we, 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 we love the geometric because it's quick and easy. It gives us a very nice summative formula that we wish we had for everything. Um, we have the divergence test, which is easy to check. Again, the thing here, even though I didn't mention it, this clearly <laughs> has limit zero, but that tells us nothing. The nth term going to zero tells us nothing about the convergence, absolutely nothing. So if you put that in your brain, in that form, then you get a thumbs up from Professor Ron. But if you ever write that on a test, we're gonna have issues because that is ridiculous. As much as I piped about this, that again, that is not a reason to assume anything about convergence. However, if you look at the limit of the nth term and it's not zero, then you're done, you're done. So, so you can make up an infinite number of, of divergent series just from that theorem. But so, so now what I want you to do is now, again, no cards for the geometric and the telescoping, the special limits, and then no cards for the integral test and the, the ideas that we have gleaned from that. So, so what you're seeing now, ladies and gentlemen, is that the integrals that we did are actually becoming very important. You're thinking, man, we're doing integrals for infinite series. So yeah, we're, we're stuck with them. We're stuck with integrals. We're stuck with derivatives. I mean, you know, the power rule. I mean, we're thinking, look at, look at all this stuff we're doing. We're taking everything we knew in the previous courses and putting it all together. It's like, it's, like it, it's an implosion of mathematics. And, and the beauty is, is that, that the more we do, the more everything makes sense in the previous course. So I'll put up a, uh, an announcement on Blackboard uh, giving you uh, more details about the test. It'll be just like the last one. Like I say, I'll give you the same window of time. And if, um, if you have, uh, you know, Good Friday, if, if, if that is something you're doing with your family or, or, and, and you have plans, then go ahead and plan to get the test done on Thursday. Uh, next Wednesday, of course, I'll do some review exercises as, as I have been doing. And I wanna give you, I wanna give you flexibility. I give you that two day window. Uh, the Thursday and the Friday, but but if you are going to be spending time with your family on Friday, then you go ahead and plan to take the test on Thursday. I don't want to move it up to Wednesday and Thursday because that's too soon. I want to give you I want to give you the time uh, to be flexible if that'll work for you. So again, uh, you know, uh, I myself am a church musician, so I will have things that I'll be doing on on Good Friday, but I will certainly be close enough to my computer uh, uh, if you have any questions. So I'll say more about that uh, as the time uh, comes to the end of the week and, and give you the same particulars. So again, nothing will change. It'll be just like the last test. And, and by now we're all professionals. We know how things work. And 
hallelujah today, Professor Ron's uh, Xfinity came through with flying colors. You know, I can't be mad at them. They, they offer me a very good service. And so uh, I'm pleased with, with that. But I appreciate your attendance today. I hope you've enjoyed this material. It's fun to teach, it's, it's exciting, and it will definitely be useful as we continue uh, in the sequel. So everybody have a great day and I look forward to seeing you uh, at the conference hours. If not, I'll, I'll see you next week. Have a great day.